time. I will see you at 4 p.m. on the Fox Business Channel today for the market close. The Daily Briefing with Dana Perino starts right now. Fox News alert the Supreme Court upholding President Trump's travel ban preventing people from several, mostly Muslim, countries from entering this one. Hello, everyone. I'm Dana Perino, and this is The Daily Briefing. The high court ruling was a close one, 5-4 decision, affirming the president's authority to regulate immigration. President Trump praising the ruling just a short time ago. A tremendous success, a tremendous victory for the American people and for our Constitution. This is a great victory for our Constitution. We have to be tough and we have to be safe and we have to be secure. At a minimum, we have to make sure that we vet people coming into the country. Chief legal correspondent and anchor of Fox News at night, Shannon Bream, is standing by outside the court. Shannon, I know this is, as you call it, your Super Bowl day when all the Supreme Court decisions come out. This is a big one. Tell us what you know. Well, they got to this position, Dana, by sticking strictly to the text of both the federal immigration law and the text of the proclamation. That's what the White House has called it. A lot of people refer to it as travel ban 3.0. They stuck to those things, just the text, and not the statements made by President Trump, both when he was a candidate and after he was sworn in. The chief justice writing for the majority had this to say, quote, by its plain language, federal immigration law grants the president broad discretion to suspend the entry of aliens into the United States. The president lawfully exercised that discretion based on his findings following a worldwide multi-agency review that entry of the covered aliens would be detrimental to the national interest. Now, there are countries who've worked their ways off the list by actually complying with the U.S. request for more information and more thorough vetting. So the administration says it's working as it should. Two separate dissents, though, both very pointed today. Justice Sotomayor said even though this is the third version of the ban, she's not buying it. This quote from her dissent. But this new window dressing cannot conceal an unassailable fact. The words of the president and his advisors create the strong perception that the proclamation is contaminated by impermissible discriminatory animus against Islam and its followers. So she felt that the things the president had said, some of his surrogates had said on the campaign trail and after and on Twitter should have been factored in. And she said, if, if you would look at all those things together, that you would reach the her conclusion uh, that this simply was driven by religious animus. Now, the case is not over. We want to make clear for people uh, what was at uh, issue here was essentially an injunction. An injunction. So the Supreme Court has told the lower court, toss the injunction. We think that uh, the plaintiffs don't have a good chance of winning this case, but now you actually have to decide it on the merits. Mm. Now, based on all of the guidance from the Supreme Court today, uh, the administration feels good that they'll do well as it goes back to the lower court. But it's not over yet, and Dana, I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if it winds up right back here. Well, and key to the president's victory was that the initial travel ban, as announced, and the chaos that resulted was then rescinded, and then a different executive order, much more targeted, including countries like North Korea and Venezuela, not Muslim countries, mm -hmm. um, that that was the key to the president's win today? Yeah, and, it, and you know, essentially the chief justice wrote, too, there's been a lot of talk about the animus behind this, but the text of the proclamation itself does not mention religion. He said, listen, the plaintiffs complain that five of seven of the countries still on the list are Muslim majority countries. But he said, listen, it's not very effective if this was supposed to be a Muslim ban because it only impacts 8% of the world's Muslim population. So they stuck to the text. They didn't take in those outside uh, arguments and statements and said, based on the face of this thing alone, we find that the president has acted lawfully. He has this power under federal law. He and any other president who would do something and craft it this way, we find it's permissible. Right. All right, Shannon Bream, thank you for that. And we'll check in with you because there's more to come from the Supreme Court before their session That's ends. Good. And for more, I am joined by Brett Baer. He's anchor of Special Report. Great to have you on the program. This was a Dana. long time in coming. Um, it was about a year and a half ago in January of 2017, right after the president had taken office, that all of the, uh, the eruption of opposition to the president on this particular issue, um, what they called a Muslim ban, um, really took all of the headlines. Remember that. But then... The president reissued the executive order, made it much more targeted, much more narrow, and I think that's probably what led to his victory in the Supreme Court today. Your thoughts? Clearly, and uh, I was simply looking at the document, 
looking at the Constitution and making an assessment. And this 5-4 ruling does just that if you look at the majority opinion. Uh, remember, this is the third iteration of the travel ban, and mm -hmm. it was a rocky start on the rollout, much perhaps like the rocky start on the zero tolerance. Um, and there's similarities there in the beginning yeah. of those policy decisions. Uh, but this is clearly, according to the president, a huge win for him. And he believes the book's closed on this. Uh, there probably will be more challenges, but not on that specific issue. Yeah, I'm, I'm perhaps not on the merits, but the politics are going to be there. Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey had this to say earlier. Watch. We're a president that wants to tear families apart. This is a moral moment in our country. What the Supreme Court decided today is not just wrong, it is dangerous. It makes us less safe and it undermines the values of our country. And we are not defined as a nation by what happens to us. We're not defined as a nation by hateful voices. I'm curious about that. If you just talk about on the merits, he thinks that the Supreme Court got it wrong, fine, but I'm not sure when he, it's persuasive when he says that we are less safe because of it. I mean, that's a really tough argument to make. I mean, the, the stipulation here is that these countries have to meet a certain bar mm -hmm. on who they're screening and how they're screening. And if they meet that bar, then they're off of this list. Chad was a country that did just that and was off the list. Um, so how it is not making us safer, it's really going to be tough on the stump to make that pitch. I also think, Dana, if anything shows you the power of the issue of justices and the mm. ability to nominate Supreme Court justices, these big decisions that are coming out of the Supreme Court that affect, affect everybody uh, really shows that that is a, a huge, huge factor politically as you go around the country. In addition, you know, there's one more um, decision that we're waiting for from the Supreme Court, and that has to do with union dues and whether people are, have to be, can be compelled to have to make them. And that certainly all the political operatives around the country are looking at that very closely as well. So your point is very well made. I want to talk about one other issue, and that's that the House Republicans are going to give it another college try on immigration. Um, Congressman Goodlatte, he has the original bill. He's tweaked it a little bit. He's going to include new, legis new words that say that it will mandate that all new employees in the U.S. are eligible to work using the E-Verify system. It creates a new visa program for foreign workers in the farming and food processing industry, so targeting a group of people there that might vote for it. It also says American companies can hire 450,000 foreign workers for three years if no U.S. workers can be found to do the job, and that failure by employees employers to use the e-verify system could lead to criminal charges and monetary fines. Those are some pretty interesting additions. Do you think that that will help uh, get this bill passed? No. I don't either. <laughs> I mean, I don't. I, I just think uh, it's a lot of busy work because they don't have the votes, at least not not that we can see up on Capitol Hill. Um, it, it clearly makes the bill stronger, but uh, they don't even have the votes in the House, let alone if you get over to the Senate. So there is a real challenge on the immigration legislation, crafting something big enough. I think there's much more uh, possibility that a narrow bill on the issue of separating families mm -hmm. that kind of backs up the executive order. Um, Kathy McMorris Rogers and others are working on that. I other thing, the other thing that's interesting on immigration is you have the vice president down in South America, along with yeah. uh, tomorrow, the Department of Homeland Security secretary, dealing with countries directly to talk about the root causes in those countries. Uh, and I think that's a huge story that really is too. overlooked. I really think so, too, because desperate people are always going to try to leave. And so the president has asked for today um, for more money for the wall. And we're going to talk to Senator Shelley Moore Capito in just a little bit about his request and if that can get done. But then also, should the United States invest more in these countries in terms of rule of law to try to prevent people from wanting to leave? Um, your final thought. I'll give it to you. And also just getting the word out about what the actual policy is, what the actual law is, that all of these countries understand where the U.S. is coming from, and if there are root causes that they can be helped with uh, to prevent those people to start that journey. Yep, indeed. All right, Brett Baer, we'll catch you tonight at 6 p.m. on Special Report. Thank you. See you, Dana. On this very busy day in Washington, President Trump having a working lunch with Republican lawmakers. So what was discussed? I'll talk to one senator who was there, Shelley Moore Capito of West Virginia. Plus, the president getting the last word on his travel ban, the high court handing him a big win today. I'm going to talk to Ari Fleischer about it next. 
The ruling shows that all of the attacks from the media and the Democrat politicians are wrong, and they turned out to be very wrong. I will always be defending this. Top story, the Supreme Court upholding the president's travel ban. The 5-4 decision by the high court ending a long, drawn-out legal battle. Joining me now is Ari Fleischer, former press secretary to President George W. Bush and a Fox News contributor. Whenever the Supreme Court finally makes a decision, Ari, still to this day, people feel like they are the final answer, like this is going to be remanded back to the lower courts, but the president certainly won today. Your thoughts? It's wonderful to see everybody, Democrat, Republican, all sides, salute the Supreme Court and follow. You know, with all the talk about civility and how torn apart we are by politics, it's wonderful to see one institution that everybody still respects, mm -hmm. and even when you disagree with it, you adhere to its rulings. What else can we do? And that's one of the greatest strengths of our democracy, people follow. That's a really great point, and it leads me to something uh, new today, is a, is a new poll, uh, and it's being commissioned by uh, former President George W. Bush and former Vice President Biden. Um, it's called the American Democracy Poll, Dem Democracy Project. A couple of things here. 55% polled said that they see democracy as weak. That's a concern. Um, yeah. Also, a poll, the poll says that 68% of Americans believe that the America is getting weaker and um, that when asked to rank the importance of living in a democracy on a scale of one to ten, you know, with ten being absolutely important, 60 percent picked ten in the new poll. Overall, 84 percent picked a number between six and ten. So it just feels a lot different from maybe when you and I grew up, when you, how you would answer those questions. But the the decimation of the institutions, that's one thing, but also you mentioned civility. People are just feeling like they're so far apart when in actually in America, you know, we have so much to be grateful for. Absolutely, Dana. And, you know, I think all of this is a reminder that the Twitter world, the nasty world that we see, really is not the real world that we live in. And especially the farther you get away from D.C., right. the farther you get away from political Twitter, you realize how respectful people are toward each other despite all the anger we have in our system. But that still doesn't mean it's okay to have the anger in our system. Democracy is refreshing. Democracy is enduring. And the best thing about our democracy particularly, it's self-correcting. If there is something wrong, we fix it. And that's the strength. And we fix it through the ballot box, not through yelling or harassing or screaming at people when they're having a meal. And right. that's nobody what we should is, always remember. That's why the Supreme Court Nobody is persuaded to today. be, uh, nobody is persuaded by the, the yelling that we see. And there certainly are, there are a lot of examples of very uncivil behavior. We see it across the board and um, it's something that uh, we should all try to get a handle on that de that democracy project poll very interesting take a look at that i also wanted to ask you about the harley davidson decision because when you and i first met yeah. way back when you were the um, spokesperson for the chairman of the ways and means committee and that's really when i learned all about you know free trade and taxes and the economic policy that how i think that things should be done and I remember bristling, of course, when presidents would weigh in about a company's decision because companies should be allowed to make decisions that they make. President Trump he certainly feels differently about Harley Davidson, who announced that it would be moving some of its production to Europe in order to avoid the tariff over there because they're worried about their business uh, in Europe. About 40 percent of their business is over there. Your thoughts on how all of this is unfolding. The president says it's all going to be fine. They quit too early. But some of these companies are making decisions before then. Huge high stakes gamble. And it would take an outsider, somebody like a Donald Trump, and I'd say this to his credit, to try to shake up the system, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China, where we all know China's been picking our pocket and stealing from us and we just acquiesce. Donald Trump comes along and says, I'll fight. I'll fight for America. I'll fight for American workers. I'll take on China. We don't know if he'll win the fight, though. And that's what Harley Davidson shows. When the president slapped tariffs on Europe, Europe slapped tariffs back. The tariffs hit Harley, Harley moves to Europe, a part of their production facility, so they won't be hit by European tariffs. That's how trade wars go. Mm. So yes, I was raised in the same school as you, Dana. <laughs> tariffs are bad, tariffs are wrong, they lead to trouble. On the other hand, if Trump can pull this off and make the rest of the world lower their tariffs and get back to more free trade, Boy, will he be a successful president. High right. stakes. We don't know how it's going to come out yet. Right. Well, Ari Fleischer, we appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Thanks, Dana. So dangerous drugs hidden in the mail, sent in packages from overseas, but the feds with a new weapon to sniff them out. Plus a critical primary day ahead of the midterms, and we will look at some of the most closely watched races happening today.
York, where Michael Grimm is fighting to get his congressional seat back after his prison stint as he runs against Dan Donovan. Joining me now is Meredith Kelly, DCCC Communications Director, and Matt Gorman. He's over at the NRCC, also doing communications as the director. Great to have you both here today. Uh, Matt, let me start with you. Um, in New York, with this Michael Grimm seat against Dan Donovan, does the NRCC you know, have a preferred outcome here? Well, you know, uh, thanks for having me, Dan. First of all, uh, we support Dan Donovan. We have from the beginning. He's run a great campaign so far. He has a record of accomplishment, and we believe he's going to be victorious tonight as well. Uh, but that's also not the only primary we're keeping our eye on tonight in New York. Upstate, in John Fast's district, there's a four-way clown car primary, essentially, among the Democrats, where single payers become the uh, issue du jour in that race mm -hmm. and a litmus test. Uh, and so whoever takes that position of raising taxes by 32 trillion, complete government control of health care, or even abolishing the VA or Medicare Part D as we know it, is going to be rendered unelectable in a general. So there's plenty of primaries to go around tonight, and we're keeping our eye on that one. What are your thoughts, Meredith, on, on that New York 11, but also if you have other ones in New York that you're looking at? Sure. Thanks for having me, Dana. Uh, in New York 11, Max Rose is a combat veteran in the Army and has since gone on to advocate for affordable health care on Staten Island. And he's going to be the Democratic nominee tonight. And he's prepared to run against convict Michael Grimm or the very desperate Dan Donovan, who has spent the last uh, several months running to his right and uh, talking about policies that really hurt New Yorkers. Taking a step back, we are very excited and proud to have more veterans, again, running all across the country from Colorado to upstate New York to that Staten Island seat. And it's a trend you're seeing everywhere. Democrats with records of service who are fighting for more affordable health care, lower prescription drug costs, and growing the economy so that wages can actually start keeping up with the cost of living. It's pretty interesting to watch all of that. I'm mean, of course on um, MJ Hager, the one in Texas. I played up some of her uh, ad about the doors opening or being closed on her and her opening them. So yes, I see that. Let me read to you mm -hmm. something from Chris Starwald, who wrote this yesterday in his halftime report. He said there are almost 60 districts where the Republicans are on defense, so the numbers look pretty grim for the red team. But the secret to Republican effort to save the House may come down to the handful of seats where they are actually playing offense. There are just seven seats currently held by Democrats where Republicans look to have a chance to actually make gains. Given the fact that it looks like, for now, the control of the House will come down to a narrow decision, these seven are taking on special significance for the GOP. And Matt, I think that's a pretty interesting place for the Republicans to be right now, where you earlier, like in January, we were talking about this huge blue wave, and now we're actually talking about the possibility of the Republicans being on offense. What's your uh, secret to all of those? Well, we're going to run every single day like we're 10 points down. We're doing that the entire cycle. Though I will say that the generic ballot has been the closest it's been all cycle. And we're going to run this race on the economy and on the, the effects of tax reform. Both in the short term, we've seen bonuses and perks and increased 401k contributions. Those are the type of things Nancy Pelosi has called crumbs. But also in the longer term as well, we see economic growth at record highs. I just saw a poll yesterday that said two-thirds of Americans feel better about the economy than they have in over 10 years. Unemployment's at record lows, wages are rising. So, you know, I think that's the choice voters are going to have this fall, whether we want to continue the economic progress we've seen or go back to the days of Speaker Pelosi with more economic stagnation and higher taxes. Meredith, I've wanted to ask uh, Democrats about this, and you're one of the best ones to ask, because how are the Democrats going to try to say that it would be better to have Democrats if the economy is still roaring and if the people feel good about the economy? What is the counter argument from, from the Democrats? I'll give you the last word. Sure. Well, very quickly, Matt mentioned the generic ballot, but I've not seen his committee release any d district specific polling to suggest that they have a single offensive opportunity on the battlefield. When it comes to the tax bill, I think voters every single day learn more about the fact that it is a massive handout to big corporations and billionaires and will increase costs, including health care premiums for everyone else. The more they learn about it, the more unpopular it becomes. We found out today that taxes uh, will go up for synagogues and churches and places of worship, which I don't think mm -hmm. Republicans want to defend. This mm -hmm. bill is getting more unpopular by the day. That's because wages still aren't keeping up with the cost of living right. and middle class people were not prioritized. Well, there you have it. Republicans and Democrats going to the polls today to see who's going to be the nominees in these big contests. Thank you, Meredith Kelly and Matt Gorman. I appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks Dana. Dana. There's a massive demonstration in Iran and challenging the government 
Citizens in Tehran are protesting economic problems as the U.S. restores sanctions, shouting death to high prices. The currency is collapsing as the government struggles to tackle double-digit inflation and high unemployment. Many shops in Tehran's oldest bazaar shutting their doors for the day, worried about their future. President Trump threatening new tariffs on Europe in a growing trade dispute. What he's now saying about Harley-Davidson's plan to shift production overseas. Plus, the Supreme Court has ruled on the travel ban, but it's not the final word just yet. We'll ask our legal expert what's next. There are no checks and balances, and in fact, if the court is saying, if you don't like our interpretation of the Immigration and Nationality Act, then you, Congress, should fix it. But do you think this Congress is going to fix it? We couldn't even pass comprehensive and comments on the travel ban. Listen. They've done it in other countries, and what we're doing is looking at countries in a rational way. I defy anybody to tell me that any of the countries saying that, that the government is in control, that the vetting process works, and terrorism is not a problem. And then how did the, uh, the meeting about appropriations with the president go? Apparently he asked for some more funding for the wall. I can see how that could be an issue. Yeah. Or... I think there's a deal to be had. I've always believed that I think most Americans would like to increase border security. And that would take more money. I voted for a bill that had $41 billion for the border. Uh, he's asking for 25. Most Americans believe that the DACA population deserves a chance to stay in the country that they call home. Most of these young people have no place else to go. They were raised in America, and their legal status is in jeopardy. So there's a deal to be had, wall for DACA. And I think the president was open to that. How you structure it is yet to be determined. But it'd be great to fund the government, uh, not shut the government down, and try to solve two problems, a broken border and give a better life to the DACA recipients who, again, have no other country to call home other than America. Thank you, Senator Graham. All right, that was Lindsey Graham. He was just leaving a meeting and gave a few comments about that Supreme Court decision. Now, let's bring in former Justice Department prosecutor James Trusty. He's our trusty lawyer. We love it when he comes on. I wanted to ask you about this. John Roberts, uh, the Chief Justice, said this in the order. Uh, Trump's order is expressly premised on legitimate purposes, preventing entry of nationals who cannot be adequately vetted and inducing other nations to improve their practices. The text says nothing about religion. You said something about this issue way back several months ago um, on this show about talk, having the court look at things that a candidate may have said and whether that should weigh in on a justice's decision. It looks like they're saying it does not. What do you think? That's exactly right. I mean, that was the issue we talked about, that when you have what we would call extrajudicial statements or, in this case, campaign stump speeches or Twitters, uh, tweets, all that is information that fairly contributes to the general public's feeling about a particular executive action. But the question is whether a court of law should actually include that in trying to figure out if something is constitutional or not. And I think we agreed that it was a little problematic, a little scary to think that you know comments made on the campaign trail are going to come back to be used in a, in a court of appeals or in a federal district court or the Supreme Court as a basis for invalidating later action. Well, so let me ask you then, do you think that this is precedent setting in, in that regard? Well, yes and no. It's kind of interesting. Justice Roberts basically says for the majority opinion, we're allowing that information to seep in. We're considering the information about Trump's statements on the stump, but we're not letting it win the day because there's so much deference to the Congress and to the president when it comes to immigration enforcement. The court's very much saying this is in their ballpark. All it takes is a rational basis to assume that this law is correct, and we find there was a rational basis for it. Now, James, this is not the final word, okay? The Supreme Court does, you know, they, they have the final word now, but it goes back to the lower court. What's the next step in this process? Well, it goes back to the, uh, the lower court, but there's a pretty darn clear message here. I mean, you're really begging to get reversed as an appellate court if you try to turn around and say that, uh, again, that the travel ban is unconstitutional. So it goes back on a remand to the lower court, but I wouldn't expect the actual ultimate result to change unless there are some judges that are hell-bent 
on making temporary headlines before they get reversed by the Supreme Court. Right. Later. Well, and perhaps they'll just drop it because that would seem like the prudent thing to do. But Justice Sotomayor, I want to uh, react to this. She wrote, taking all the relevant evidence together, a reasonable observer would conclude that the proclamation was driven primarily by anti-Muslim animus rather than by the government's asserted national security justifications. Even before being sworn into office, then candidate Trump said that Islam hates us, warned that we're having problems with the Muslims and we're having problems with Muslims coming into the country. And yet this, um, we've, sh we've shown the map several times. The, the countries that are on this list are basically, it should be called the failed state ban. Um, and with Venezuela and North Korea on the list, that's not a predominantly Muslim country. So what is she trying to get at? Well, I think it's clear that, well, a couple things. One is I'm pretty sure that she won't be voting for President Trump next round. But beyond that, it, it's clear that she's very much encouraged uh, the use of these prior statements out of court. In other words, she's looking at the campaign statements and saying this is so deeply offensive that I would invalidate this law. Justice Roberts basically says, look, there's a process for countries to end up on this list. It's yeah. not permanent. They can fix it at some point. We've had countries drop off and drop on. And he basically referred to that as empty rhetoric. I mean, she went on to liken it to the Japanese internment camps. And I think the majority opinion basically says that's an overreach and kind of an emotional one. Indeed. All right, James Trusty, thanks for being here. Sure, thanks. And more reaction to the travel ban ruling. Senator Shelley Moore Capito will join us fresh off of a worky lunch with President Trump at the White House. We're going to hear what she has to say just minutes away. And now we have uh, President Trump, you know, blasting Harley Davidson, warning the company will face a backlash if it moves some jobs overseas. Harley blaming the decision on tariffs, the president slamming them just a few moments ago. They announced it early this year. So Harley Davidson is using that as an excuse. And I don't like that because I've been very good to Harley Davidson and they used it as an excuse. And I think the people that ride Harleys are not happy with Harley Davidson. And I wouldn't be either. Uh, but mostly companies are coming back to our country. Scott Lincecum is an international trade attorney and an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. I wanted to see if you had any hair left because I know that you're pulling your hair out over this issue and I, you should follow him on Twitter if you want to learn a lot about trade. Take a listen, um, Scott, to what Sarah Sanders said about tariffs yesterday. The European Union is trying to punish U.S. workers because they've engaged uh, repeatedly in unfair trade practices. And the president is saying enough is enough. We'd like to work with the EU uh, to work on a level playing field. Your thoughts about this Harley Davidson kerfuffle? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's hardly surprising that when the U.S. government raises uh, manufacturer steel and aluminum prices by 50 percent in the last year because of tariffs and then picks a needless fight with their biggest export mar markets who inevitably retaliate, um, that there's going to be some blowback. And, you know, Harley is an example of that. But there are, uh, unfortunately, there are going to be other examples. Uh, there is a Missouri nail maker, a Arkansas tire producer. There are others of uh, these stories trickling out. Um, you know, these, these tariffs hurt American companies, and the retaliation hurts American exports. President Trump, just a few moments ago when he was in the um, cabinet room, was talking about how all the, how all the good news is coming for uh, steel companies, steel producers. And there are some jobs coming back, and steel plants either Re, you know, reopening production. But what about the consumers of that steel? Is that what you're getting at in terms of there are consequences for those companies? Right, exactly. You know, um, certainly if you create an island of high priced steel, you're going to get a little more investment in the steel industry. But unfortunately, uh, you know, steel workers are outnumbered by workers in steel consuming industries by about 40 to 1. So, <laughs> you know, for every job you might uh, protect or save, you're going to kill uh, dozens of other jobs uh, that need access to those materials. And that doesn't even think or consider the, the retaliation. And that's retaliation, unfortunately, isn't even finished. Uh, the Canadian government on July 1 will retaliate as well. And, and just to correct Sarah Sanders there, uh, the steel and aluminum tariffs are, were a protectionist response on national security grounds. They had nothing to do with European protectionism, nothing to do with Canadian dairy protectionism. Yeah, that, they, this they, is they about hung, they hung uh, it on US national security and the yeah. inevitable blowback. So let me ask you about this. The president also said that behind the scenes, the discussions are going very well, that the, that the United States is winning on the negotiations. He's not going to show his cards because he's going to negotiate the best deal. Um, and he says it's going to happen very quickly. And what I understand is that these companies, 
especially ones that want uh, to keep their production here in America. They want the president to succeed, but they're saying we don't have much time before we ha start having some pain because of these decisions. Right, exactly. You know, the, uh, the, the tariffs have been in, in place in full for a month, but there are more tariffs coming uh, next week on Chinese imports. The president has threatened even more tariffs on automotive exports or imports, excuse me. And, you know, these companies, they, they have a bottom line. They have shareholders and they yeah. really can't wait that long. And I think that's why just today you saw uh, hundreds of chambers of commerce uh, across the country urging the Senate to take up Senator Corker's bill that would actually uh, limit the president's tariff powers on, on national security grounds. Just the type of stuff that's Could hurting I get one, Harley and other manufacturers. Could I get one last comment from you? And we have about a minute left. I just want to sure. see, do you draw a distinction and a difference between trade practices with our European partners and with China? I, I tend to see them a little bit differently, given what the president is also sure. concerned about in terms of intellectual property being stolen when it comes to right. China. I'll give you the last word. Yeah, sure. And there is a difference uh, between Chinese intellectual property practices and uh, the general trade practices of some of our closest allies like Canada and Europe. Uh, the problem is that the solution in both cases for the president is tariffs. And in both cases, that is the wrong solution. There are ways to go about trying to encourage reforms of China's policies and China's protectionism and intellectual property theft. But tariffs are, are a tried and true way to achieve failure, not mm. success. All right, Scott Lincecum, I appreciate your perspective. Thank you. A pleasure. The Orlando airport is stepping up security in a... The White House will award the highest military honor to the widow of a World War II veteran who risked his own life to save his fellow soldiers. Ahead, you'll hear how the Army Lieutenant Garland Connor used telephone wire to stop the enemy. That and the rest of the day's headlines, top of the hour on Shepard Smith Reporting. We'll see you then. This is a Fox News alert. President Trump wrapping up a working lunch with Republican lawmakers at the White House. The president calling the Supreme Court decision upholding his travel ban, quote, a great victory. He also spoke about his long promised border wall. Discussing today uh, the funding of the wall, which uh, we very much need. We started the wall. We're spending uh, a lot of energy and a lot of time and started up in San Diego and other places. It's under construction now. We have $1.6 billion. But we're going to ask for an increase in wall spending so we can finish it quicker. Members of both chambers of Congress attended the lunch, including my next guest, Senator Shelley Moore Capito of West Virginia. She's a member of the Appropriations and Commerce Committees, which are probably the two of the best committees you want your mm -hmm. senator to be on. So great, great to have you here. Tell us a little bit about the president's position about him wanting more money when it comes to the wall. Well, I was in a meeting last week with the president on Homeland Security because I chair that subcommittee. He was very emphatic on uh, then, as he was today, on a robust funding for the wall, which we have in our bill. We have a good down payment on it. Uh, he, as he said in the clip there, he's frustrated with the amount once, once more. So we're going to work towards that because I believe firmly that uh, a wall is in our best interest, and the people of West Virginia believe that as well. So we're going to do what we can to work together to, to meet the president's expectations. And so what would be the roadblocks to that? Is it Democratic opposition or is it the calendar? I know that you would like to see the appropriations process get to be back to more regular order. Right. Well, the good news is the appropriations process is moving quicker. We just passed three bills last night out of the Senate, and I've been in the Senate now for three years, and that's the first time we've done that. So that allows you to have your own priorities in the spending bills, and it allows, uh, it allows the president, uh, I think, to work with us to get those priorities in there. At the same time, um, we're going to keep working. My bill passed out of committee bipartisan. There is resistance to the, to the wall funding, but I think um, – a strong border protection is going to be uh, in all of our best interests, and I think the Democrats will join us. I want you to take a listen to something that Tom Cole said okay. about um, the immigration process and the possibility of the House being able to get something passed and over to the right. Senate. Here's Tom right. Cole. No, there was no grumbling about the president. As a matter of fact, uh, Bob Goodlatte said he just literally talked to the president within the last five or ten minutes, and he is very much for the bill. And uh, so, again, we know we uh, we would love the president to embrace the bill more fully and actively because we think it really reflects where he's at on the issue. Uh, but, uh, again, certainly no complaints about him. When it comes to just wanting to get something done, get the, get the issue really 
Finally, a, a bill that the president could sign to his desk. Do you think that there's more of an appetite for that now, especially after the last several weeks of talking about the family separation issue at the border? Well, I think that the family separation issue certainly uh, puts a lot of intensity to the issue. But we also have the DACA issue that we did not settle in March that's going to have a court decision here in the next several months. I think the feeling generally is if we can solve the DACA problem at, and uh, marry it with the border wall, we have two really uh, needing, needy problems that can have a joint solution. And, and I think that's what Tom Cole was talking about. We're working towards the president seemed very amenable to that, although I don't want to speak for a particular bill there in his case. So I think um, I think we need something more to push uh, the 25 billion for the wall that the president needs. And I think DACA offers that opportunity. Do you think, I know that you're not up for re-election, but um, your no. counterpart, your Democratic counterpart in West Virginia, uh, jo uh, Joe Manchin, is up for re-election. But of course, I'm sure you're called upon to campaign for your colleagues on the Republican side to see if they can keep those seats or to even right. flip some. And I wonder how much you think that this immigration issue will drive people either to the, for the polls, either way. I know that uh, the president's base certainly cares a lot about it, but if right. you rev up one base, you also rev up the other one. And I'm just, what, when you're, what are you seeing out there from that perspective? Well, it probably depends on the states. I mean, I'm not a border state, but I do have a, uh, West Virginians who believe in the wall, who believe in uh, lawful entry into the country, who embrace uh, lawful immigration. And I think that's the I think it will drive the intensity in the election on both sides. At this point, if we look at the safety issues, uh, I think that the intensity is really more on the safe uh, borders. Uh, the drugs that are coming into this country are ruining a state like mine and others. And, and it's uh, it, a lot of it's coming across our border from the southern border. Mm -hmm. So there again is where another intensity of, of a voter is going to be. Stop these drugs and stop criminals and, and uh, let's have legal immigration through our points of entry and, and we can handle it that way. Tell me a little bit more just about that. We have about a minute left. Uh, Vice President Pence is in Brazil today. He's going to be in a couple of different Latin American countries. You know, as he tr as he's in the region, and as he expresses the concerns of the United States. I mean, is the drug issue one that you think will certainly drive attention? Where you think that the drug problems that are experienced across the country, but certainly in West Virginia, that that mm -hmm. is actually one of the keys to help solving it? I do think it's one of the keys. When you look at fentanyl, which is killing half the people that in my mm -hmm. state who, who overdose and die, uh, when you look at 64,000 Americans losing their lives, these are our children and our family members. I think the drug issue is is a major issue because we know it's coming from the southern border. Wow, and very interesting. All right, Senator Shelley Moore Capito, thank you. Yes, thank you, Dana. A stunning amount of drugs hidden in the mail. We'll tell you about how the tree to commit to facial recognition technology for all international travelers. The U.S. Customs and Border Patrol Agency is already testing the high-tech scanning at 13 major U.S. airports. Customs officials say the scanning process takes less than two seconds and it has a 99% match rate. So there's a new weapon to fight the opioid epidemic. The Fed's using it to sniff out drugs hidden in packages sent through the mail. Matt Finn is live in Chicago with the best assignment of the day. Matt. Dana, we report so often about the opioid epidemic in America and the surge in use of fentanyl, which is a synthetic painkiller that is toxic to the touch and so lethal, just a few milligrams can kill a person. Well, believe it or not, some of the front lines in preventing these drugs from getting into American communities happens right here at the international arrivals for the U.S. Postal Service. The U.S. Customs and Border Patrol agents screen all international packages coming into our country. Agents say they scan 1.7 million packages a day. They're all x-rayed and sniffed by dog teams. Packages containing hidden pills, unusual liquids, or powders are tested using a state-of-the-art machine called the Gemini. The Gemini is capable of rapidly identifying 22,000 substances. Here is an example of how it works. And I'm going to activate the, the laser. And within a few seconds, it's going to uh, take its reading. So in this case, it's uh, fentanyl hydrochloride, and so that would be a, a Schedule I narcotic that, that we would seize. 
Customs and Border Patrol seizes tens of thousands of illegal packages a year. Federal agents turn these drug-stuffed packages over to police for prosecution. Now, the senders, they get really crafty. They try to disguise these lethal drugs as beauty products, shampoo, vitamins. They even stuff them in teddy bears. U.S. Border and Customs says today fentanyl is the most frequently seized synthetic opioid. The amount is staggering. 1,476 pounds of it was seized last year. And again, just a few milligrams can kill a person. That figure has skyrocketed from just two pounds seized in 2013. Now, last week, the U.S. House passed a comprehensive package to combat the drug, drug epidemic here in America, and it would give more authority to Border Patrol and the U.S. Postal Service to crack down on mm -hmm. people who are stuffing drugs and sending them to packages here in America. Dana. Wow, Matt, that's fascinating. Thank you for the report. Take a look at this guy making his home now in Maine. We'll introduce you to the canine making life easier for one former president.